I invite you to open and grab a Bible and open it to Isaiah chapter 25, verses 6 through 9. Isaiah 25, verses 6 through 9. And as we prepare our hearts and minds to receive and hear God's word this morning, we go to our God in prayer. Our first prayer is for our own hearts and minds that the Holy Spirit would open them to receive gratefully the word of the Lord. Our second prayer is for our brothers and sisters in Christ that the Holy Spirit would comfort their hearts and minds with the word of the Lord and the gospel message this morning. And finally, I ask that you would pray for me that I would speak faithfully and truthfully the word of the Lord and proclaim boldly the gospel of Jesus Christ for all people to hear. Psalm 19 says, may the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable and pleasing to you, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. Amen. So we are in the middle of a sermon series called The Good Book, focused on the Bible. And my goal as your pastor has always been to get you to be in the Word of God, to love the Word of God, to hear the Word of God, which is why all my sermons have the boring introduction of, we're going to pray, and then I'm going to tell you to open a Bible. And then I'm going to tell you to open a Bible again because I can still see you, right? You didn't disappear. You're not hiding from me, right? Because we want to be people that are in God's Word and that know God's Word and are able to share God's Word. And this morning, as we learn from God's Word, I want to talk about what the hope of the book is, what the ultimate hope of why do we go to God's Word for comfort, for peace, for joy, for hope in the midst of difficult seasons and circumstances of life, what is ultimately the book about? What is it teaching us about our final and true and best hope of all? And so as we dive into Isaiah 25, I want to say a few statements that you're probably not going to like. Tell me if you've heard these before. Just wait. (laughs) Wait a minute. How many of you have realized that when someone says wait a minute, it's not actually a minute? It's eternity, right? It just goes on and on forever. You'll just have to wait, right? Especially when you're excited for something. Anybody been looking forward to something, right? My dad is coming this week to visit, and we've been counting down the days, and I can't wait for it. It's so exciting, and it's, it's really close, but guess what it also feels like? Really far away, like so many days, right? Like, and so... Sometimes we're looking forward to something that is joyful and awesome and amazing, and you just have to what? Wait. And it stinks, right? It's not fun having to wait for something joyful and hopeful and something that we're looking forward to with great expectations. And the flip side of that is also when you're going through difficult things and you're waiting for them to pass, right? You know, you're just going to have to wait. It's just going to take some time to move on and to get through it. So either way, whether we are looking forward with joy and expectation of like, wow, I can't wait for this thing to happen, how many of you get excited to wait for stuff? You know, you're like, no, it's just, I don't want to wait a minute. And then when you're going through something difficult, a rough season of life, and you don't know which way is up or down, and you're confused, and you don't know where the hope is, how many of you enjoy Well, you're just going to have to wait for it to pass. And here's why I bring this up. The Hebrew word for hope is the word wait. It's kind of a bummer, right? I know I teach you Greek and Hebrew words sometimes, and you're like, could you teach us a better one today? Because no one's excited to wait, yet they're they're connected in the Bible, this idea, the, the word is kiva, and it comes from the word for cord. So think of a rope or a cord that's being t- pulled very tightly, and there's tension. And then when that tension finally releases, that pop is the word kiva, or hope. It's that tension of waiting for those expectations, those longings and desires to finally be fulfilled. And that, that feeling and that joy when all the expectations are finally met, when all the longings of our hearts and desires are finally met, we get to rejoice in it. 
but there's also the tension of, but I gotta wait a minute sometimes. Right? You're just gonna have to wait. And in Isaiah 25, if you open a Bible to it, we're gonna see God do a few things here all around the idea of hope and waiting and why it's good for us. So in Isaiah chapter 25, we're gonna start in verse six. God does four things for us. The first is that he makes a promise. So in verse six, God makes a promise for you and me and for all people. He says, on this mountain, the Lord of hosts will make for all peoples a feast of rich food, a feast of well-aged wine, of rich food full of marrow, of aged wine well refined. This is, as Revelation will call it in the future, the marriage feast of the Lamb. This is a giant celebration for all of God's people, meaning the wait is over. The party is finally here. Revelation calls it the marriage feast of the Lamb. Right? We, if you ever been to an awesome wedding with an awesome wedding reception, you're like, finally, we're married and we're here at the party and isn't this amazing, right? The wait is over. The longing is over. And God makes a promise and says, I'm going to do this. On this mountain, I'm going to keep this promise. And so here's his promise. I'm going to bring you to the, the wedding reception. I'm going to bring you to the marriage feast of I'm going to bring you to the party. And if you read carefully in the poetry here, there's no more sadness, there's no more grief, there's no more sorrow, there's no more need, there's no more lacking, right? If we're at this wonderful party with God and all God's people, then all the things that we are typically hoping for and longing for and, and looking at the world and going, wow, look at this big mess. Look at all the problems. Look at all the things that God has called us to do to serve and love and help people. But why does he do that? Because there is a lack. There is poverty. There is sorrow. There is grief. There is chaos in the world. And so God, in verse 6, is making this wonderful promise that says, one day on this mountain, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to fix it all. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make it all right I'm gonna get rid of all the sin, all the brokenness, all the fighting, all the war, all the poverty, all the death, all the sorrow, everything you could possibly list of what is wrong with this world. And I imagine you could come up with a pretty long list if you think about it for a while. He's making a promise to you and to me and the whole world saying, I'm going to fix it. But you're gonna have to wait a minute. And we're gonna talk about the having to wait a minute in a moment because you're going to have to wait for it. <laughs> Verse 7, he does the second thing, which is he takes care of sin. Because if you think about it, all the root problems of this world come down to sin. Now, a lot of people hear that, and they go, well, that sounds like a cheap answer. Oh, well, it's sin, right? Have you ever seen something go wrong in the world and ask yourself why? No one? Well, Y'all are way less in psychotic than I am. Right? <laughs> right? You look at what's going on in the world sometimes, and you see the news, or you see what's going on in your life or a life of loved ones, and you go, why, God? Why is this happening? And now we know the answer is sin, but we also don't really like that answer because it kind of feels like, well, that sounds cheap. Like, I want to know the real reason why this specific thing is happening to me or to us or to them. But in order to get to that wonderful promise of verse six, God's gotta do a few things, and one of the things he's gonna do is he's gonna take care of sin. So in verse seven, it says, he will swallow up on this mountain the covering that is cast over all peoples, the veil that is spread over all nations. Sometimes in the Bible, sin is described, or the, the consequence of sin is described as this veil, this thing that separates us. Because if you go back to Adam and Eve in the first sin, what happens is all the perfect relationships get messed up. They get broken and fractured. Their relationship with each other is, is irrevocably uh, destroyed and wounded and messed up. Our relationship with God has the same things happen to it. And so there's this veil, there's this dividing point between us and God individually and then us and other people. How many of you know that from experience because you've had a fight or disagreement with somebody you love? Show of hands. And you really love them. And you're like, nope, still going to fight about it. Still going to disagree. 
right? Now, stay with me. In those moments when you have conflict, disagreement with somebody, how many of you are like, I want to sit down and have a meal with this person right now? Anybody want verse six in that moment? Like, oh, cool, we're going to be at a party together. And you're like, I'm going to sit at the other end of the table in heaven, right? But God is saying, I'm going to swallow it up. It's going to be completely gone. That's a wonderful picture. Because what God is promising to do with our sin here is not just sweep it under the rug, right? Forgiveness is so much more than that. Right? As Christians, we don't tell people when they sin against us, it's okay, don't worry about it. Anybody have had that conversation before? Like, you know you messed up, you apologize, and someone says, yeah, it's okay, don't worry about it. Or you've told them, yeah, it's okay, don't worry about it. God doesn't look at our sin and say, it's okay, don't worry about it. He looks at our sin and he swallows it up. He gets rid of it completely by forgiving it through the cross of Christ. And that is so much better. Because it's not that it's hidden away and, you know, in a secret place anymore. It's completely gone. And so when he says, I'm gonna swallow up on this mountain, the covering that is cast over all the peoples, the veil that is spread over all nations, he's saying, I'm gonna get rid of the sin that is dividing all of us. If you pay attention to the news, you know there's a lot of sin in the world. There's a lot of division and conflict in the world. Some of it is just relational between you and people you love and work with and live with and know. And other times it's between one nation and another nation. And the hope that God is telling us that he's going to deliver in verse six when he says, I'm gonna bring everybody together in this marriage feast of the Lamb is a hope that says, I've swallowed up and taken care of all the sin. Your sin is forgiven, it is gone. All the sin in the world, it is forgiven, it is gone, it is swallowed up, which means there is no more conflict. There is no more fighting or disagreeing. There is no more war. That's a wonderful promise that God is giving to us. In verse eight, God says his third statement where he will take care of death because Romans tells us that the wages of sin is death. The ultimate consequence of sin is not just fighting or disagreement or conflict or broken relationships, ultimately the ultimate consequence of sin is death itself. And in verse eight, he says, he will swallow up death forever. And the Lord God will wipe away tears from all faces and the reproach of his people. He will take away from all the earth for the Lord has spoken. Isn't that that's one of my favorite verses where he's just like, I want to swallow up death. And we're like, how do we know it's true? And God goes, because the Lord has spoken, right? The final authority over all things has said what's going to happen. And according to his word, death itself, the ultimate consequence of our sin will be swallowed up. Now, what's happening here is something that's really cool. When Isaiah was writing this, one of the nations that the people of Israel were at war with and often were tempted to follow their gods was the nation of Canaan. And one of their major gods was a guy named Baal, or Baal, depending on, it's an old Hebrew word, you could say it however you want, guys, all right? So Baal was this powerful god, and for, by many people in the Canaanite world and religion, he was viewed as the most powerful god. And he went to war with some of the other gods, and eventually death itself stopped liking Baal and went to war with Baal and captured his wife. And Baal went down there to go to war with death to rescue his wife. And the Canaanite literature says Baal was swallowed up by death and he could not escape it. And then God comes along and says, well, I've spoken and here's what I'm gonna do. All your other gods, right? And this is what we do. This is what idolatry is, y'all. We were looking for hope, we're looking for comfort, and so what do you do? You go looking for gods that will rescue you. You go looking for gods that will give you comfort and hope, because you're tired of waiting. But they can't conquer death. 
They can't conquer and swallow up sin for us because how many of you have tried idolatry in the past? Anybody? Show of hands. Yeah, a few of us, we've tried it. We've been like, this will, this will please me. This will come for me. This is how Martin Luther, by the way, described what a God is. He said, whatever your heart turns to for comfort and hope in your time of need is truly your God. What a convicting statement, right? So many other things, so many other bales, so many other idols that I turn to go, that will be the savior. That will be the thing, that will be the person that gives me comfort and hope. But at the end of the day, sin typically swallows up our idols. Death swallows up our idols and we can't escape the consequences of sin and death. Except for, for one way, and that's through the promises of our God. He says, Baal failed. All the other gods, they failed. They can't get past death. But here's what I'm going to do for you. I'm going to swallow up death. And here's the key word, forever. Meaning, I'm going to make a world where there is no more sin. There is no more death. There is no more war, conflict, disagreement, famine, starvation, poverty, everything lacking and bad in our world. He's saying, it's all going to be undone. I'm going to swallow it up forever so it doesn't exist anymore including death itself, I will swallow up forever. So verse six gives us this beautiful promise. It says, here's what the world's gonna look like, and here's how we're gonna get there. I'm gonna swallow up sin forever. I'm gonna swallow up death forever. And then verse nine, he tells us, ultimately, here's how you can trust it, right? Verse eight says, because the Lord has spoken. And that's really beautiful, and it's really comforting until you're facing sin and death. And then it can be difficult because you go, well, how do I know the promise is really true? Because that's what Satan wants you to think and question. How do I know the promise is really true, that God will really do this? And verse nine is the answer. It says, it will be said on that day, this day when God swallows up sin and swallows up death and conquers them forever, he says, it will be said on this day, behold, this is our God. We have what? waited for him, that he might save us. This is the Lord. We have waited for him. Let us be glad and rejoice in his salvation. You see why the word kiva is so powerful? Because we're living between verses six and nine. We, we have the hope, right? We have Jesus. He has swallowed up sin on the cross. He has swallowed up death on Easter Sunday when he rose from the grave and gave us the promise of eternal life. And yet, we're still in the tension of what? How many of you are aware there's still sin in your life? Not everything is going perfectly for you. Right? And how many of us are aware there's still death in the world? And so we're living in this tension of kiva, of the, we have the hope, we're not letting go, and the rope is not letting go of us. God's not letting go of you in the midst of the suffering and the sin and the death, but he's holding on to us, and we're waiting for what? That day. We're waiting for that day where he fulfills his promise once and for all. And so we say in verse nine, it'll be said on that day, behold, this is our God. We're gonna get to shout to the universe, Jesus is our God. He sits on the throne of heaven, and he's the one who has done We've been waiting for him. And now he has done what he has promised to do, and we will get to rejoice and celebrate. Now, here's one last thing I want you to take notes on, remember, and hold on to. There is a difference between biblical hope and just optimism. Optimism looks at bad situations or potentially bad situations and tries to figure out what is the best possible outcome. What could be good about this? But it's focused on circumstance. Biblical hope is not centered on circumstance, but a person. Right, read verse nine with me again. Behold, this is our God. We have waited for what? Him that he might save us. This is the Lord we have waited for, what? Him. We have not waited for the day. We have not waited for the circumstance or the situation to change. We are saying we have kivad, we have hoped for him. Biblical hope, Christian hope, is not based on optimism or circumstance or situations, but it is based on 
a person. It is based on who our God is, based on Jesus Christ and what he has done, and that he keeps his promises. Oftentimes, if you go through the Bible and you see the word wait or hoped, there's a lot of confidence, in, right? Verses seven and eight are beautiful, but in the meantime, there's sin and death. <laughs> but verse nine says, but I have hope, why? Because I'm waiting on God who keeps his promises, not on what Tuesday brings or Wednesday brings. You see the difference? Now here's the deal. Throughout the Bible, our hope is founded on our God and who he is and his promises, not our circumstances. One of my favorite books is the book of Lamentations. And in Lamentations chapter three it says this, but this I call to mind and therefore I have hope. Now, what you have to remember is the context of Lamentations is Jeremiah is sitting on a hill watching Jerusalem be obliterated by the Babylonians and all of his friends and loved ones being either killed or taken into captivity, and he's watching the temple be destroyed. So if you want to talk about having a really bad day and having a day that feels like it is filled with sin and death and disaster and a day that would lack all hope, it's a day like that for Jeremiah. And this is what he says in the midst of this. He goes, but I call this to mind, and therefore I have hope. Now, here's what he's going to call to mind that gives him hope in the midst of the world's worst circumstances. The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. And then he says this, the Lord is my portion. Therefore, I will hope in him. Jeremiah is facing the most unimaginable, horrific circumstances you could face in life. And he goes, but this thing I call to mind and therefore I have hope. And his answer is, God. He says, because I have my God and I have his promises because I have him, I have hope. Revelation 21 is a passage that I read often with you guys and share with you over and over and over again in the hopes that we will memorize it. But in Revelation 21, verse four, Jesus makes a promise that echoes what we just read in Isaiah. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning nor crying nor pain anymore for the former things have passed away. And he who is seated on the throne said, behold, I am making all things new. This is a passage that is wonderfully beautiful and important for us to know. Because Jesus is sitting on the throne of heaven, he's looking at his people who are suffering and going through sin and death, and he's saying, but here's where you can find your hope. You can find your hope in me because I'm the God who makes all things new. You can be sitting on the hillside with Jeremiah going, where is the hope? Where is this thing gonna change? How is this gonna get better? And join him in saying, I still have hope, why? Because my God is on the throne of heaven and he has promised to make all things new. Now here's what I love, many people leave this part off, but at the end of verse five, Jesus sitting on the throne says this, write this down, for these words are trustworthy and true. Now write it down, why? Because these words that you and I have in God's word, these words of hope and comfort, no matter what we are facing in life, are trustworthy and true, because your God and your Jesus is trustworthy and true. And so whatever you are facing in life, when we go to the scriptures, or when we share the scriptures with people we know that are hurting and suffering, what we point them to, the ultimate hope that we get and that we offer to the world, is not, you know what, next week will be better. You know, you, you just have to wait and you'll get through it. No, what we offer is the ultimate hope, which is, Jesus is making all things new for all people. And through his death and through his resurrection, you are invited to the marriage feast of the Lamb to enjoy that salvation for all eternity. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we give thanks that our ultimate hope is you yourself, that through your death, you have swallowed up sin forever. And through your resurrection, you have swallowed up death forever so that we know we have victory over both sin, death, and the devil. And that we will enjoy the marriage feast of the Lamb in all eternity with you in heaven. 
Help us to find comfort and hope when we turn to your word, trusting in your promises that you are making all things new. And may we share that hope with the world around us. In your name we pray, amen.